Thank you, gentlemen. Everybody enjoy a SWAT? Sure was a good time, wasn't it? Uh, I don't mean to overload you here. What we're going to do, we're going to talk about, if you can go over PowerPoint first. Uh, what we're going to talk about is about 50 woods that grow in Texas to use for bowl turning. Now, because we're talking about 50 of them, we're going to kind of move fast here. But uh, what I want to do is, is I'm uh, – next slide. There's 1,100 species of trees in the United States. That's native to the United States. And there's 200 of them in Texas. We're only going to talk about 50 of those. But what kind of frustrates me sometimes when I, I see turners is they're buying these woods from Africa and South America without realizing the kind of woods we have here and how good they can be to turn objects out of. So that's what we're going to try to do today is, is reintroduce you to something you probably kind of already knew, but you just didn't know how to use it. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. Next. Uh-oh. <laughs> Here's what you're up against. We can use the, the Texas woods on the left, and that's what we're going to pay for them aboard foot. Or we can use foreign wood. How many of you can afford to use foreign woods at those rates and make very many turned objects? I'm going to give you an all small alternatives. That second page come from a website. This is called Rare Woods USA. But, there, you know, there's many websites for wood. This guy's honest enough to tell you a board foot what it costs. Most of them just tell you this is a stick and it's $30, right? You don't really tell you the volume of wood. So anyway, that's kind of what you're looking at on cost-wise. Next slide. Where can you get information on woods? Uh, I'm going to give you some. This program you're seeing, I have five handouts. They're 62 pages long, so I've got five. But they're going to put them on the web, this whole slide series on the website. And when I cover it, I'm going to be covering just very little, but there's a lot of information here. So go look it up on the website and take time to read it all, and you'll gather a lot more information. But one of the problems we got as wood turners is, everybody's kind of familiar with that book, right? It's not even helped to us as wood turners. They're talking about landscape trees. They're, and if you read it, it'll tell you the leaf and the color and what kind of shade maybe it'll give, but it'll never tell you what you can turn out of it or what the texture of the wood is and how strong it is, or is it brittle, does it crack? The books, landscape books are a little useless to you. Uh, there is many wood books that help you identify trees. The very worst is this, Arbor Days. It'll show you a leaf and say, that's a tree. You've got no idea what kind of wood you can turn out of. So they're no help to you. These go a little deeper, and sometimes they'll tell you, well, you know, 100 years ago they used to make wagon tongues out of them. Well, that's a little bit of help. At least you understand the strength of it. And then you can get one of these monstrosities. There's 20,000 plants in this thing. It's absolutely no help whatsoever to us as wood turners. <laughs> if you're into master gardening, maybe. Some of the books that are helpful, though, is uh, some of the, I found this one here, Woodworker's Guide to Wood. On the very back of this, there's a whole reference of all these books, so don't keep trying to keep up with them. You'll, you'll have them at the end. They show you pictures of the wood and actually tell you the characteristics of it. And they'll tell you what you can probably use it for, you know, given it's terroristic. Is it coarse? Is it fine grain? Is it colored? Is it split? Or what its strength is. So some of these wood books for woodworkers are good. What's not good is a lot of the woods books for woodworkers tell, show you how to use a plane. They really don't show you how to use the wood. We'll talk about it. Uh, one of the best ones, if you guys hadn't seen this, Understanding Wood, very deep book, but there is a lot of information about understanding the wood we use for our craft. So that's some of the things that y'all can use to do a little further research on. They're good reference books. What we're going to talk about today, next slide, is we're going to talk about these characteristics because when we go choose, if we're going to make a bowl. What do we think about? Most of us have gotten the bad habit. We look around and says, oh, I've got a piece of walnut, so I guess I'm going to make it out of walnut. Isn't that kind of the way we've been doing? 
Well, we kind of ought to be thinking about, well, I'm going to turn a bowl. Give me the six best woods to do it, and how hard are they obtained, and what look am I going to get so that we have a better finished product because the wood matches what we're trying to accomplish on our lathe better. So I'm trying to get you in that mode. But some of the things we're going to think about before we turn something is we're going to look at the color of the wood. Is it light colored? Is it dark like walnut or, or white like hackberry? Uh, is it fine or coarse grain? If we're doing a little old finel, we need some very fine, hard grain wood. Otherwise, it's just going to break off when we try to turn it, right? But yet something big, big bowl or something, where's one? Something big like this don't hardly, you know, strength the wood isn't a big issue on an object like that. That happens to be mesquite. But anyway, uh, and stable woods. You don't want to shrink or crack. How many people have turned a piece and then it starts cracking on you because you turned it green and then it, as it dries, it either warps badly or cracks. So you need to choose a piece of wood for your project that is more or less stable on the thing. And if you're a segmenter, how many people in here are segmenters? That's about the same in our club, guys. There's a few that's really dedicated to it. And y'all know as segmenters that there are certain woods that just don't do good when you start gluing them up with other woods. They just don't play well with other woods, and they'll tend to crack on you. So you've got to start thinking about the wood you're going to use for segmenting even. Uh, hardness of wood or soft wood. That's more how hard it is going to be to turn. Also, how much, what are you going to use it for? If I'm making a dinner plate out of this thing and I'm going to drop it on the table, I probably want sort of a hard wood and not one that will dent, right? So you kind of think again about what you're going to use the object for you're going to turn. Uh, and of course, we turn some natural edge things. You've got to choose a piece of wood that the bark will stay on. And what characteristics make the bark stay on versus fall off before you get through? It's part of wood characteristics. Uh, of course, some of us turn out of burls and other pieces of wood, and they're kind of a genius of their own. <laughs> Everybody knows every one of those is kind of different. Next slide. We're not going to talk about all these physical characters that a wood engineer would do. <laughs> it's no use to us, guys. It's hard to translate that, and it's of no use. That's just information you can look at. We're going to talk about plants in groups. I'm going to show you a few leaves just so you'll know what tree you're looking at. In Texas, we have three primary oak trees, <coughs> groups of oak trees. Let's put it this way. The first of them that we know so much is a post oak tree. Anybody know what a post oak? is it'll always have a rounded leaf on it, a rounded end. Now there's post oak, there's water oak, there's there's a bunch of different oaks, but all of the white oak family will have rounded leaf, round lobes on the leaves, whereas a red oak will have points. And what's significant about that is if we take this but this and try to turn it, this is this red oak is going to be very open grain. It doesn't mean it won't make a beautiful object. You do not want to put it outside, turn something and put it outside because that red oak tends to rot because the open grainness of it. White oak, though, is very slick, smooth, closed grain, makes a lot better objects. We don't have pure white oaks like a northern white oak you'd buy at the lumber yard around here, but we have trees that are so close to it that they're very good for that. I'm going to start passing this around, these, a lot of stuff around. If y'all will just start passing around and then make a pile at the back when it gets to the last person on the thing. Let's see, how we do. You know, start. Now, these bowls I'm handing you, I want you to look at several characteristics of them. One, it's going to have the wood name. Normally, there's four or five pieces of wood so that you can compare, in this case, all the different oaks side by side to see the characteristics. See the grain texture. When you do, look at them like this so that you're looking at the end grain. Turn it up and look at the side grain. See what you're going to get if you turn something out of these objects. And you can look at the woods side by side. And it'll give you a bunch of information. On here is a percentage. Intentionally, I glued up dry wood with wet wood. Why, do, why is that a no-no? For us wood turners, you all know as that other, the wet wood dries, it's going to crack, shrink, warp. I had done this for our club because I'm going to bring these back in about a year and we're going to have a lesson on why you don't, you turn, you know, glue up a bunch of wet wood together. So you'll see that already since some of these have been done only about four weeks, 
where they join, you'll start seeing cracks already in them where the wet wood is pulling away from the dry wood. So when you find a big percentage difference, you'll start seeing some damage already occurring in these bolts. These are nothing but illustrated pieces for that purpose. Yes? Yes, the, I, I just took a moisture meter and stuck it on the wood. I glued them all up. I cut them and glued them all in just a matter of an hour or two. And then I put a moisture meter reading on them. Thing. Uh, if you want to look at more, here is three of the oaks, much bigger pieces. that will give you an example of uh, some of the more texture of it. Slide. Let's go into some of the things. Uh, okay, slide once. Now one by next one. Next one. All right. On your right there, what you're looking at is my 12-inch joiner table. I cut a piece of white oak, ripped it. It's moist. I laid it on my table. Fifteen minutes later, that's what the tannin in the oak did to my table, cast iron table. All oaks have tannin in them. The Indians used to just peel the barks off and boil it and, and use it on sheep hides. They would take and tan it brown using the oak off of thing. That's how powerful that is. But it's also a mild acid, so y'all be careful around your machinery laying wet pieces of oak wood. It's going to do this, and all you can do now is set and sandpaper and grind all that off and redo your tables. Happens very quickly, just a matter of a few minutes on the thing. Uh, next slide. Here is kind of a, an illustration, the difference between white oak and red oak. White oak, these grains are going to be filled. These are going to be open like soda straws. So they're hard to fill, but red oak is a beautiful oak to make thing. Just be aware of where you're going for your object you're going to turn. Next. Uh, uh, white oak is more resistant to rot. That's about all you're going to get out of that other than it's finer grain. And you can tell that when you look at that bowl about the difference in the texture, how much finer it is. Next slide. There's your red oak group. If y'all are into scientific, you're going to see me referring to some scientific names. I don't mean to overload you with that. I'm just trying to identify when you go to these books and stuff, that's the only way you can tell one tree from the other. But as generally, y'all know that almost every tree we have here locally, we have a local name for it. But that's why you have to kind of wade through that a little bit and you sometimes mention scientific names to, so we know we're talking about the same thing. Next slide. Maple trees. How many maple trees we got in Texas? We got nine in Texas, but there's a lot of maple trees. The most prominent maple tree we have here in Texas is a a what? Box elder native. Silver maple mostly comes from nurseries. There is a lot of them around, but they were planted as a nursery tree. Now, here's part of the confusion, guys. I'm going to be showing you where some of these come native-wise in Texas. But we know we're seeing them right here in the Metroplex, even though they're not native. Many plants are brought in as nursery trees. You know, when you plant your front yard, you plant your silver maple, you plant your mulberry, you planted other ones that aren't native to this area, but we've got them. So don't mean we can't turn wood out of them just because they're here. Uh, on the maple trees, this silver maple, uh, okay, tell me this. There's a silver maple, there's a red maple, which of those maples is not a maple? Which of those names in red is not a true maple? Somebody want to tell me? Who said that? You're the winner. <laughs> Ambrosia maple, you get to keep that. Let, let me explain my rules here, guys. I have these wood to give out. These are samples. <laughs> If it's got my card on it, you can take them home, okay, if I give them to you. I need the samples back in case I need to do this again. That's a piece of ambrosia maple. Ambrosia is just a soft maple, and it can be any of those maples that an ambrosia me beetle gets into and then leaves a track, and it causes bacterial stain in the wood. looks like spalding to us, you know, if you're familiar with spalding on the thing. So, but... 
box elder flip uh now just go on one more silver silver maple we're going to find the inertia trade it's a good wood to use it's a soft wood but it's good to use for projects and we got a lot of it here in the metroplex been brought in nursery trees uh red maple is found mostly in the east texas on the area one thing back up one slide you see this map you're going to see this you see that little bitty black area that's the only place silver maple is native doesn't mean we don't have it here in the metroplex though we have box elder everywhere flip on down hard maple is mostly up north it's sugar, they call them sugar maple, one to make maple syrup out of. We don't have them here locally. But it's a really good wood to turn stuff, and you can see in this example what it looks like. Next one. Box elder. Everybody kind of knows that red on the thing. It's a red stain in the wood. Uh, okay. I've got this piece of walnut here. I'm going to give to the first person to tell me what causes that red stain. If you're wood turners, you're going to have three or four answers. Okay, I know that. So, what, what's your answer? Iron. Fungus. That's sort of right. Who else? The box elder beetle is one thought. Okay, anybody else? Well, everybody's getting warm, but if you look on the internet, this has been an issue among wood turners, and when you talk to a group, see, we're getting different answers, and that, that's common. I, all I'm going to say is this. If you go research on the Internet, here, you're closer than anybody. Hit your walnut, go home. <laughs> what is happening with box elders? This is where you f uh, find the red. You can find box elders, but it may not necessarily be red, uh, have the red in it. What causes the red, apparently, and there's two research papers from doctorate degree guys that were doing the research to find out and what they found out is when the box elder or soft maple tree that's local to us gets damaged like if you run into it or a windstorm breaks a limb off anytime it's threatened it actually makes this red dye that injects through the, th the tree and what it's there for is so that fungus can not attack the tree that's what the research paper says so everybody's kind of right. The box elder beetle, they, they researched it, and their conclusion was that that wasn't part of the problem other than it might help move the fungus into the tree and attack it if an outside fungus. So basically all you can get from this, if you want some really red box elder, go around and look at something been damaged. The more damaged they are, the more likely they're going to be red because that's a reaction to the damage. So and box elders are, are all over. Next slide. Am I moving around too no, much? No. <laughs> okay. As in the Brambrosia maple that we talked about a while ago, these are some of the various figurations that can happen in maple. More so in maple than almost any other wood, you can get these various things like spalting, quilting, curly, bird's eye. Hard maples is most prominent for showing bird's eye. Uh, hard maple, and of course we don't have them here locally, but you can buy the stuff. Uh, next slide. Okay, I'm going to show you the maple bowl and pass it around. Go ahead. Yes, I've seen it. I Many of them talked about it. Huh? I didn't have a chance to ask him. Okay. Well, it turned out I asked him the same question. His tag was Red River Maple. turned out that's the name of his company. It wasn't the name of the piece of wood. <laughs> I had to ask him to find that out. <laughs> well, the, the box elder, though, is pretty prominent, maybe two-thirds of Texas has them around. And a lot of us don't really know what they look like or, or around them, so you, you miss them. And they're also, they don't grow in huge, like forests, like a post oak, you know, is everywhere. You'll find just little places that don't be two or three, and then somewhere else there'll be some more. But if you find them, you, again, the way you find the red in them, which is what everybody wants. If, if anybody turned a box elder, how many in here has turned a piece of box elder? Everybody know how bad it stinks when you're doing it. it. Smells like you're turning a sewage plant. 
but it makes beautiful work, and once you get it turned and dried, that odor goes away. I think the odor may come from that red fungus or thing. What he had was box elder. He had was box elder from uh, Fannin County, he told me, is where he got it. Uh, there's quite a bit of, of box elder around in various groups. Apparently Fannin County is one of them, but there's also some down by Waco. There's a big grove of them, and there's, there's around different places. So if you get them, the one thing about the, uh, well, I'm going to go into that a little more, but let me just kind of mention this a little bit. The box elder, the red, if you expose the red to sunlight or air, the red goes away or turns brown. It's not pretty. The only way you can keep the red is cut it, make your bowl real quick, seal it. Keep it out of the sunlight. If you're going to have anywhere you can get sunlight, put marine varnish on it where it's got protection from sunlight. I don't think UV protectors in it. Okay, next slide. Oh, well, wait a minute. Let's go here. We're, we're on another thing. We're, talk, we're going to talk about a various number of woods, and I bet most of these y'all have never turned anything out of. Uh, let's just go over the first one. Honey locust, our local thorn tree. If you're brave enough to go cut one of them, they're beautiful wood. You can look at this bowl and see some of the pattern of it in there. Um, that's mesquite. I didn't bring a, an extra piece, but it's in that bowl. But honey locust is a beautiful wood to turn. Now, where you can also find it, uh, years ago, they made some hybrids that you can buy in the nursery trade that are thornless. So you can find honey locusts with no thorns, but that's going to be a nursery tree. Doesn't mean people don't have plant in their yard. You find them a lot out in California. That was a big popular tree 20 years ago out in California, it was a thornless honey locust tree. So it's a great piece of wood to turn. Very stable, kind of hard, but it's a good piece of wood. Cedar elm and American elm are two local elms. Cedar elm's got your slaw leaf. American elm's a big leaf that grows everywhere. We have kind of passed up American elm. American elm has a lot of beautiful characteristics in the bark. It's a hard, stable wood. We need to be turning a lot more of this. This will make some beautiful things. Take a second look at American elm. American elm members got the big leaves on them. I mean, a lot of time the leaves will be this long and that wide, big green leaves. A lot of them people cut them down. Yes. No, there's still a lot of them around because I just cut one down the other day. <laughs> Me and John did. Uh, there's a lot of them around. There is an elm leaf beetle that has damaged some of them in other areas. They don't seem to be a problem in Texas. I've never seen the damage here in Texas. Now, somebody may correct me on that, but I, I, the elm leaf beetle has been an issue some back up, up east, I understand, on the thing. Chestnut is one of the things that's totally disappeared due to a virus. You know, there's various woods that we've really lost that are beautiful woods to work with on the thing. But look at that American elm. See if maybe you shouldn't take a look at it again and turn something out of it. And there's a lot of wood available, cheap. I mean, just go cut down a tree or look on somebody's curb. You'll see in a city a lot, they've grown them and then cut them down. You'll find pieces of it on the curb. Beach. Turn through to we got the beach. American beach. Y'all see how little area Texas really beach is native to? But you go into Arkansas, or especially into Kentucky or Tennessee, you get a lot of it. I put these two together for a reason that I want y'all to look. This is a piece of beach that's been dried and kept out of the weather. This piece of beach has been took out and buried in wet sawdust and allowed to spald. That's a nice name for we're letting it rot on the thing. I want you to look at how much it changes the characteristics of the wood when you, you spalled it versus keep it protected. Totally two different woods. Good tool handle wood if you get a hold of it. And people in Tennessee and Kentucky, they'll practically give you the logs to carry them off. It's just kind of in the way for them. Cherry also. I, I hadn't under, quite understood that. I went to Kentucky, and the guy practically gave me 15,000 pounds of cherry log just to carry them off because he thought of them as like a weed. <laughs> Here in Texas, we'd kill for a piece of cherry. <laughs> So, 
Anyway, but beach covers a little area, but it sure does spalled easy, as well as pecan wood does on the thing. Uh, that mesquite got a good place. I kind of went past pine. Why aren't we turning pine? All these Texas is full of pine. It's a, it's got a great texture to it, and it, because of the very, it has very wide grain. See the spacing here? That's the, the thing you, you kind of see with all the pines is they grow so quick that the, the grain is kind of wide, but that doesn't mean it don't create its own characteristics. I mean, mesquite has its own, grows crooked grain. This grows straight grain at least, but it's its own characteristics. One warning about pine is usually want it where it's dried a while. Otherwise, it's pitchy and sticky and it's a little hard to finish. It's better off if you've let it dry quite a bit before you start turning with it. Or if kill dried is better, but it's hard to kill dry, you know, a big chunk of wood like this. I don't think. But pine is a good product. You don't take a second look at that. That may be something, of course, very economical to turn. All right, next slide. All right, other woods that we need to be talking about. Hickory. There's actually two very popular hickories here are native to Texas, Shagbart and Mana. I can't even pronounce the second name. Mana something hickory. And, uh, but they're so similar that it's very difficult to tell the difference in them. Uh, both of them are very hard woods. This is Shagbark hickory. You can get them clear grain, but notice how this and how the knots showed up on it. That can be a bold characteristics or a vase, you know, will look all right. One morning you need to turn this wet because when it gets dry, it's a very hard wood. It's going to be difficult to turn as a hard wood. But y'all look at that. It's really a beautifully grained wood. We make a lot of tool handles in our club out of it because it's just so sturdy and uh, doesn't move, doesn't warp, bend. So very good wood to go uh, thing. Uh, its cousin is pecan. And uh, pecan wood, we pretty well know it, but if you go to a wholesale lumber place and you tell them you want pecan wood, you're probably going to get hickory. In the lumber trade, sawmill trade, they just kind of throw them all in one pile. So unless you really kind of study them and look at characters, and the problem about hickory is if you get one from deep south Texas or you get one from north Texas, the wood is going to look just kind of different just because of our different growth characteristics and different minerals in the soil and stuff. So sometimes it's hard to, to sift through that and find out if you're getting true pecan unless you know the source directly on the thing. Uh, Question on that. Sure. The pecan we have around here in any way, uh, if it's green, it turns just fine. Once you let it dry, it's hard. It's, it's abrasive. Uh, it's <laughs> Someone explained that, that that was the root filtration system or whatever was pulling minerals up. It pulls up minerals, and there's actually some uh, silicone stuff in it, but I'm not talking soft. I'm talk talking about slick silicone. They understand that it, it actually abrades the tools. But it's the same reason you're having trouble turning hickory. Remember, there's, they're cousins. They're first cousins, so you're going to have a problem. Both of them, they get dry. Turn them wet. Uh, it's in the wood, yeah, and there's not much you can do about it. Uh, it's tough turning a pecan bowl, letting it dry six months, and come back and turn it. Your tool just kind of yes. slip off of it. It's hard to do. It's kind of something you probably ought to turn from start with from green, as green wood. It, with one exception, spalled it. Now the wood gets soft, and uh, both hickory or pecan, if you spalled it, it softens the wood. Now you can turn it. So I, I turn spalled pecan all the time, and it's just great. It, it don't it just doesn't have the same problem because it it's half rotted. Remember, spal spalding does. We want to pull it just before it gets punky, but we want it a little rotten so it's soft. Okay. Um, piece of walnut. Who can tell me the most premier hardwood we got in the United States to make cabinets and, and any kind of woodworking project out of? Come on, think about it. <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> Guys, I'm giving you hints here. I can only do this. <laughs> uh, 
I think you hollered first. <laughs> Who hollered second? Let's see here. One of you guys back there did. Hollered second. All right. Black walnut. Why are we going behind Albany when we got black walnut? It's a pretty wood. It turns great. It's a cousin to pecan and hickory, but it's much softer. We can turn uh, black walnut as a green wood or a dry wood. It'll cut. It'll shape. It's stable. It has a great look to it. When it, I'm going to explain something else. But anyway, you can see how much characteristic change it is to have that dark walnut and how beautiful an object. We've been turning a bunch of big vases out of it. And one of the characteristics of walnut is the grain, as it comes up on a big vase, it just sort of flows, especially if you have a knot. It'll kind of flow around that knot. makes great big, if you're going to make something taller vases, walnut is a gorgeous wood for a tall vase. I don't think. I'm going to pass that around. All right. Good question. Very good question. I have samples. <laughs> this is Illinois black walnut. This is Bonham, Texas black walnut. What you notice on the characteristics, let's see, can we get, is that good enough y'all can kind of get a picture of it? Do you see how much closer the grain is on the northern walnut? Now, the Texas walnut is much wider grain because we have longer growing season. It's not snowing nine months out of the year. So it grows longer down here. Doesn't mean it's not a great, beautiful wood to turn out of. We got different characteristics. So what are you turning? Do you want the fine grain and go buy a piece of wood that's been shipped down here, or you want to go at your own here locally? It's a great wood. It has a great pattern to it, but there's a difference on the grain. I'll pass these around, and y'all look at the difference in the grain structure on them. John's going to talk about all that later. Can we relay that question? Toxicity of walnut. We're going to talk about red cedar too, but John's going to talk about that in a minute. So I'm going to belay that question for the time being. Mesquite. One of the most unusual woods we have both in Texas and the United States. When you look at a piece of wood for its characteristics. One thing you'll notice about mesquite, one, it's gorgeous when you finish it. Who would have thought a mesquite tree turned and made a beautiful object? But what's its characteristics? It'll nearly always have wind cracks in a big chunk. It's going to have pitch pockets in it. The limb will go about this high before it branches off. You don't see any straight column or trees. It's just not in the mesquite's nature to grow like that. Uh, you can see on this particular bowl how it started to pull out from the, the pith of the bowl on the thing, and I just filled it and kept going, but it still turned out a nice wood. But what you'll notice about this piece is how much there's no straight grain in it. The grain is just wandering around in there. But it's a very stable. Do you realize between totally wet and totally dry, mesquite only loses 2% of its volume? It's the most stable of all of our woods. You can turn it green and never worry about it warping or shrinking. But you got to find the piece that's good enough to turn. <laughs> Head and pitch pockets, not wind cracks, or not limbs on the thing. But take a look at, at mesquite and the grain texture. It's kind of fine grain, so it really turns like that. And it's got a pattern on the edge of it. It's no trouble to turn a small pattern uh, with mesquite because it's fine grain. So it's a dark wood. Uh, my brother has a ranch out ranger. And this honey mesquite is the official name of Texas mesquite. But I have noticed there's more than really one culliver of that. On my brother's place, I can go down in the, the river bottom, and I can cut a piece of mesquite, and it's got a pink tint to it on the wood. Yet I can go up on the hill, and it's dark, almost chocolate brown. And they're both mesquite trees that look identical. Different growth characteristics were dry land, raising them on the top of a mineral hill versus a river bottom. And they're in the same place. I mean, they're not a mile apart. So mesquite has its own characteristics, but all of them are good. I skipped over something. We were talking about pecan a while ago. 
first person to tell me the Texas State tree. Raise your hand, whoever said that. <laughs> we got a new winner back here. <laughs> here, I seen him raise his hand first. <laughs> now, what's particular about that piece of pecan right there is it's spalded. It's wormy. It'll make a wonderful vase, a gorgeous vase if you'll turn it as a vase. But it's fully spalded. We'll get into spalding later. Mesquite wood. Some of the characteristics of it. Here's your wind cracking around the pith. Y'all see that? Let's see. Get his camera. Oh, that's sort of. That's, that's all right. It, it's not necessary to get a camera on. But anyway, it'll wind crack on you. You cut them in half. You can see various like here. This this would be called a wind crack. So we're just cracking for no reason. A lot of times it'll when it moves. Apparently there's not a lot of glue that holds the the fibers together, and the wind tends to crack them. Now what do we like to make a lot of is the yellow. When we first turn it's yellow, but use the sapwood as a as a piece. Uh, I think on some of my the examples of. Uh, Go back to mesquite, where it's just got showing several mesquite bowls. But you'll see that a lot of times we'll use that soft wood on mesquite as uh, to highlights, and it's really pretty to leave it on there. And the other day I seen a snowman made out of it. Both had the soft wood and left little bark on it. It looked great. You know, it's just design characteristics on the thing. Now, anybody know what the settlers used to do with the beans on mesquite? You've already won. You don't, you can't win again. <laughs> they used to make flour. All right, what did the Indians do with the beans? <laughs> they certainly did. The Indians, before we, uh, supposedly the white men sold them alcohol. Here you go. Uh, they used to take the beans and mash them up and, and make alcohol out of them. So... <laughs> well, from what I could read, they take it and, and get them green, and they mash them up and put them in a pot and let them ferment. So they're rotted, and then they drink it. And I think the reason they like whiskey that we were selling them, because firm rotted beans just don't sound very tasteful. <laughs> it may have alcohol content, it just don't sound very tasteful on the thing. Walnut. <sighs> There's getting to be in the United States sort of not a total shortage because there's still a lot of walnut trees out there. But a lot of the settlers, when they come into this area, walnut trees started off mostly on the east, but they're all over the state. Uh, they don't do too well in West Texas just because of drier conditions on the thing. But used to, settlers used to come in and bring walnuts. And if you go up in Oklahoma, there's a lot of walnut trees where they brought them in like that and just planted a, a walnut. And it made shade, and the nuts, can you all tell me what they used to do with the nuts, the old settlers? Right, somebody might raise their hand so I'll know where to give this piece of wood to. Here, you hadn't won anything, that's right. That makes a black die if you crush them down. <laughs> didn't I give you, you, didn't you win something while ago? You will before it's over. You know all the answers, so you're going you're gonna to win something here in a minute. Okay, next group of. Uh, hardwood. Whoops, you, you, whoa, we skipped something here. Back up some. Pecan, hickory, walnut. Oh, I know what I'm supposed to do. Um, go back, going back to where you were, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Skeet. 